Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Uh, I'm tired and sleep deprived because of uh, some travel snafus that happened this week, but we didn't want to let that stop us recording a podcast. So here we are. We hope you enjoy it. Um, email me at jacob at cognitive.investments if you want to talk about our investment advisory services, our family office services, our research, speaking gigs, anything else. Uh, please do reach out there. And otherwise, uh, stay careful out there. Uh, take good care of each other. See you out there. All right, listeners. So we are back at it. I'm going to tell you right now, neither Rob nor I are operating at 100% mental capacity. I'll let Rob speak for himself. Um, I'm going to have a brief 30-second diatribe here about Delta fucking airlines that uh, delayed my first flight up to Minot for a speaking gig five hours instead of getting in at 5 p.m. I got in at 1 a.m., whatever. Then on the way back, just canceled a flight. Was supposed to get home at 1 o'clock, pick my daughter up, do a bunch of stuff. Didn't get, Didn't walk in the door last night until midnight. I had to rush my daughter to the doctor this morning, rush her to daycare, blah, blah, blah. Now I've plopped and sat myself down. And I've spent most of the week thinking about pulses, which for you Americans who seem to not know what pulses are, that's like lentils and chickpeas and things like that. So it's going to be an interesting podcast this week. Lots of lots of lentils on my brain. Rob, what's your excuse? <laughs> well, I can tell you, uh, I don't think I have 60 minutes of lentil talk in me. Well, why not? I have, I, I, I have, I have a whole deck about lentils. Well, as I say also, I said this to the audience, I've, I've done a couple um, speeches now to, to farmers who grow these specific crops, and I keep on telling them, aside from being a geopolitical expert and everything else that's nice in my bio, I would consider myself one of the world's, well, one of America's foremost experts on hummus. And I think the measly, disgusting crap that, that goes f for hummus in our grocery stores is just disgusting. And I would love to consult with a chickpea farmer who wants to build a, a, vertical, a vertically integrated supply chain so that they can sell really beautiful hummus to Brooklyn hipsters for like $20 a bowl. I'm telling you there's a business opportunity here, but I can't get anyone to take me up on it. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> I see you're laughing too. So you you don't want to you don't want to pitch this to our our high net worth investors. No. Okay. Fine. I'll I'll keep it to myself. No. I'm sorry. I'm, I was just letting that one slide. Okay. Well, you know, I can't I can't let it slide. Anyway, so listeners, like <laughs> in your lives, you're not always at 100 percent capacity. We're not always at 100 percent capacity. We're still going to give you a podcast. Uh, like we've still been following things going on in the world. But if uh, if it seems a little more disjointed, um, give us the benefit of the doubt. Um, Rob, why don't we start with China? Because you had a couple different things in China that um, were sticking out for you, um, and then we can go from there. <clears throat> yeah, so there's a few things in the news this week that were of interest, and I think they're all loosely kind of connected. And if I had to say how they were loosely connected, it's policy or geopolitical decisions in China or around China that are impacting the rest of the world in a significant way that may not be so obvious. Um, so three things in the news this week that are all connected along that theme. The first is uh, semiconductors. So for those who don't follow this as closely as we do, because we're uh, a little bit in the weeds more than the average Joe, uh, the semiconductor uh, industry, you would never know it because the stocks are making new all-time highs and absolutely ripping. The semiconductor industry has been in the absolute dumps uh, for the last year. 2023 was not a good year for semiconductors. There was a significant decline year over year in, uh, in revenues for pretty much everything in semis. And um, the expectations for 2024 and the reason why stocks are making new highs uh, are... are because those expectations are extremely high. So everyone is baking in a strong, strong rebound as companies build out equipment for AI and um, you know everything around that whole theme that people are very excited about. And there was a data point that came out just today where um, everyone sort of knows that China has been buying a lot of semiconductor equipment in the last year. That's been something that a lot of companies on their earnings calls have sort of you know, made clear, alluded to some cases, it's, you know, not too uh, explicit as far as how much. Um, but this really caught my eye. So Bloomberg came out and they uh, 
put together the data using Chinese customs information uh, to show that China bought $40 billion of semiconductor equipment in 2023, which is a significant amount. And the reason why they're buying it is really to get ahead of any potential blockages or uh, a true, you know, functional uh, trade embargoes on equipment, software, everything that goes with it. Um, but it's the reason why it's interesting is because you have this sort of artificial demand that's being created out of China because of this fear of trade war, because of these uh, barriers that are being put up. And it's really influencing the numbers for lots of American companies. And when you look at that that comp, that 2023 $40 billion, is China going to buy another $40 billion of semiconductor equipment in 2024? It's it's hard to believe. So if you're optimistic about semiconductors, you're thinking about AI, like you cannot ignore this issue because this is the 600 pound gorilla in the room that isn't getting as much attention as it might because no one wants to admit, hey, China's buying our stuff hand over fist. Um, it's not exactly the narrative you want to put out there. So that was one thing in my triad of data points. I don't know if you want to talk about that and then yeah, let's, let's, get into the others. Let's talk about that one for a second because I think there's more to it because there is a company that came out and had to tell that story when they reported earnings this week, which is ASML. Um, and ASML is this Dutch company. They make the equipment that you need to make the most cutting edge semiconductor. So if you're in the semiconductor space, you know all this. But if you are not in the semiconductor space, basically the Netherlands has a complete and total monopoly on this equipment that you need to make the most cutting edge chips, um, this company called ASML. Now, you might also remember, we talked about this on the podcast last year, the United States was lobbying the Dutch government, also the Japanese government and a few others, to impose export restrictions so that this semiconductor equipment would not make it to China. And one of the reasons the United States was so focused on the Netherlands is because the equipment that the Netherlands makes, it's really, really hard to replicate. <clears throat> China's been able to replicate a lot of other parts of the semiconductor supply chain, um, but this is just something it's going to take. It's not even clear that they can replicate it, even if they threw however much money at it and spent however much years doing it. It's a, it's a real um, sort of victory for intellectual property and for innovation and things like that within the Netherlands. So the Netherlands, or at least the Dutch government, said, okay, we're going along with the export restrictions and that the rules were going to come into play September 1st. Um, <clears throat> And that was the Dutch government. ASML never really said anything publicly about this. But Bloomberg is now reporting that there was a quote-unquote secret agreement to limit ASML holdings. I don't know how something can be secret if it's in Bloomberg, but that there was that ASML was part of the deal and that at first ASML went along with it. But to your point, um, there was weak demand everywhere else. So then ASML started lobbying for exemptions. They wanted to be able to push back the deadline for some of the, as, these export controls. They wanted to be able to export to China. And the result is that China became, became ASML's biggest market last year. And if you look at the geographic breakdown that they reported in their, their earnings for Q4 compared to Q1, so in Q1, 8% of ASML exports went to China. In Q4, that was 39%. <laughs> so, and uh, if you want to like just see the juxtaposition, in Q1, 49% went to Taiwan. That declined to 13% in quarter four. Um, so I hear you on maybe companies don't want that to be the narrative, but it's too bad. And publicly traded companies do have to report these things. And arguably the most important company that the United States needed not to export their kit and their gear to China said, I'm sorry, like, we, th this is our market. We sort of have to sell. And I think... Um, you know the 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 takeaway, and maybe this will dovetail with with two of your with um, your other points about China is that it's one thing to say there's going to be a trade war with China and there's going to be decoupling and deglobalization. But when a lot of these companies actually peek over the ledge and say, okay, well, what does the world look like without Chinese demand? And I mean, like really interrogate, okay, what if what if it's a zero on Chinese demand for next year? Suddenly it gets very scary. And that's why the Biden administration, I think, has walked back some of the more expansive export controls and restrictions they were talking about and are trying to make nice, um, well, not make nice, but at least have some kind of pragmatic relationship with China where they can be adversaries and competitors in some ways, but also cooperate on an economic basis. And it goes back to why, unfortunately, the U.S. election is so important, because Trump is not going to do that. If you have a Trump White House, they're going to go back to what they were doing before, most likely, which is 
full on scorched earth, not the surgical stuff, not willing to walk stuff back, but really wanting to push the trade war. And there's arguments for both of those. I'm not trying to say that one is right or one is wrong. I'm just trying to underscore you know, we're in a very different world now with US-China relations than we were even 12 months ago. And that world is at serious risk of being dislodged on November 4th. And I think that's one of the reasons the Chinese have the impetus to be buying these things hand over fist. So th that underscores a lot of what you're saying, but I also just wanted to make it clear, it's not just about the US and the semiconductor supply chain is literally the most globalized supply chain in the world. And when you actually get down to the brass tacks of decoupling, it turns out it's a little harder than, uh, you know, just a, a sound bit or a political pronouncement makes it. And you've made the point many times in the past, and I think it's a very good one, about trade wars and uh, embargoes and tariffs, that they're most powerful when they're being threatened but not used. And that once you use them, they lose a lot of their, uh, their, their, their impotence, you know, their, their potency, I mean. Um, it's an interesting case in, in this scenario because, as you said, the U.S. was banging its chest, was making a point about, hey, ASML and, and the Japanese were going to restrict the uh, amount that you can uh, uh, sell into, into Chinese markets. But effectively, they didn't, right? So they got all, the, all of the negatives of having declared the trade war and putting China into this defensive stance. And as you can see, that's having a real and very significant effect on their behavior. And yet, the, the actual law has not been effective. So they're not even getting the benefit of keeping the equipment out of Chinese hands. It would be like, you know, if it's uh, 1941 and the United States declares no more oil to Japan. And then they just keep selling them oil, you know, like how would, <laughs> how would things have, have progressed differently? Because of course, historically, because they did cut it off, it precipitated the war. So um, it's a, it's a, it seems like a mea culpa sort of own goal on the, on the part of the American side. And I don't know if you have a view on that, but from my amateur point of view, it seems like this was not particularly well thought out. I'm sure it was well thought out. It's just you, you have a real, and it was certainly well thought out by the Biden administration. I mean, the Trump administration had a very well thought out logic for why they wanted the trade war with China. I would argue some of the tools and tactics that they use weren't as well thought out because a lot of Trump's appointees weren't as, um, weren't as experienced as some of the people that Biden has put in. Biden basically took what Trump did and tightened the screws. He said, all right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thread the needle right here. This is a really severe weakness for the Chinese. We're going to really screw this one tight. There's this other one that doesn't really do much for us on the national security level, and it's just going to hurt U.S. companies. So we're going to open that valve a little bit, but it's still sort of basically the same thing. But to your point, I think the disjuncture here is between the United States government and Western governments in general and United States businesses. Because the United States government, certainly since the Soviet Union collapsed, and at least rhetorically before then, was the white knight of capitalism and the guardian of globalization and everything was going to be relative advantage and you make this and we make this and we trade and we want no friction between markets. We just want to be in competitive in a global marketplace. And that's what companies, especially U.S. companies, that, that's the world that they live in. That's where their strategies are oriented for. And starting, really starting with Obama in 2014, continuing with Trump, continuing with Biden, you have a U.S. government that has turned its back on that and is saying, no, we want to make things in America again. We, wanna, we don't want to be exposed to these markets. It's not going to be a level playing field. Um, and when you have that dynamic... You know, companies have to go along with that because they're thinking about lobbying the government and getting certain concessions and things like that. But it's it's philosophically and strategically different than the world that the United States was trying to protect, you know, even as, as recently as 2013. So I, I wouldn't say that it's not well thought out. I think U.S. companies have a well thought out strategy that has worked for decades. And the United States government and policy officials have well thought out reasons, even if I may disagree with some of them, about why China is an enemy and why the United States needs to do these things to encourage more manufacturing. But what you don't have in the United States is you can't have a president who, has, who is then going to come in and say, OK, this is how we're doing things and have everyone listen to him. It's not like China where Xi Jinping can go out and say, this is what we're doing now, and most everybody has to listen to him, or else they go to a gulag. Um, and that, I think, is is sort of um, that I think is the source of the tension that you're talking about there. 
And to what extent do you think just the policy uncertainty exacerbates everything? So China doesn't know who's going to win the presidential election. The potential policy outcomes could be vastly different. Um, How does that impact the way nations behave? Do you have any view on that? Well, I think, I mean, China in particular, you can see how they're behaving. They're trying to import things hand over fist and do things with the United States and with companies in the United States before the election. And if they can continue on with the current relationship with the White House, great. And if they have to pivot, they'll pivot and they have a strategy for that as well. But I think it's true that most of the world is waiting on the results of the U.S. election because of how different Trump policies would be uh, from Biden policies. But I think the broader thing here is just, and it goes beyond semiconductors, it's that with every passing month, there is more friction in global trade. And it started with, you know, things like Huawei and, and semiconductors and telecoms gear. But now it's down to things like automotive parts and energy flows for nothing that have to do with the U.S. and China, but have to do with Houthi militants in Yemen that nobody else has heard of. Like we've gone from an increase in tariffs and embargoes to actual physical blockages and disruptions in large parts of the world, um, you know. <clears throat> We're recording here on Thursday, January 25th, and apologies for my my voice. I'm fighting through a, a cold, as you can probably hear it in my voice. Um, you know, sitting here on Thursday, January 25th, the Houthis have still not been quelled, and the United States keeps bombing them, and they can't seem to quell them. And one of the things that I saw was um, this report from Freight Waves talked about that companies are now beginning um, not just to go around Africa, but are using sea air routes to bypass options. Uh, or to bypass the Red Sea because of shipping delays. And, you know, we've sort of alluded to, the, alluded to this and we've put out research reports on this, but if you're going to the air now, it's not, and, and I, maybe this is why I couldn't get any of my flights on time. Maybe Delta is busy uh, getting automotive parts from China to, I would actually like that. That would at least have a reason for why Delta screwed me over the past couple of days. Thanks, Delta. Um, but yeah, we've talked about how uh, air routes and air transport in the world is also not particularly good. Just look at a map of of where you can actually fly a plane over the Eurasian continent. It's a lot, the, the, the open spaces where airspace is open are a lot smaller than you'd think and depends a lot on whether Azerbaijan and Armenia are going to be nice to each other. So you just start poking around the world and we've got this, you know, this volatile clash between public and private interests, between great powers, um, a turn away from globalization, even as there's a lot of inertia keeping globalization in place. And then we're now we're getting the physical disruptions. We're getting security issues are now actually physically blocking the trade route. So you put it all together, it just means a lot more friction. And I mean, not to beat a dead horse, but it's, you know, we talked about this last week and it's, it's why I'm increasingly worried about what inflation looks like here for the rest of the year. I mean, maybe it's fine, maybe it'll go down, but you know, US grew 3.3% GDP last quarter. And then we're going to, we're going to tack on like all of these, uh, you know, supply side things and disruptions and things like that. Like that doesn't look like a recipe for lower prices in the market to me. Um, so, you know, you start with Chinese semiconductors and zoom all the way out. Um, and it doesn't look particularly pretty. Yeah. And again, not to repeat something that we said a few weeks ago, but I think it's such an important point. It, It bears repeating, which is, this is coming against the backdrop of people expecting that inflation is is troughing, that it's uh, troughing and continuing lower and normalizing, and you know, so-called uh, you know, team transitory is is claiming to have won the day. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of risks to that, as you point out. Um, the thing on the physical side is not only do you get physical disruptions that make things have more friction and more costly. Um, But then you have sort of the snowball effect of the physical disruption. So for example, if companies are uh, diverting more freight into the air, the air, you know, bottlenecks are already quite clogged. So we have, you know, air traffic control problems as you unfortunately discovered this week. that's not a unique to U.S. situation. So the point is you're putting additional stress on another system because it's like if uh, an athlete gets an injury and you just sort of favor one leg a little bit more, but then that puts additional stress on that good leg, which then increases the probability of getting an injury. Uh, So you have that physical aspect of it, but then you just have, and this is a concept 
that's so critical to finance that is often difficult to wrap your head around if you don't have a finance background, but just the price of risk. So when things are going well, the price of risk goes down. Uh, when you have no realistic expectation that someone's going to fire a missile at your ship, the cost of insurance is not very high for that ship. Um, what we're seeing all over the place is as things just get more uncertain, the cost of risk is going up across all sorts of assets. And it's not just, you know, we mentioned two weeks ago, uh, the cost of insuring the actual container ships has gone up significantly in the London markets. That itself is going to contribute to inflation because now you need to raise the price all else equal on container ships to recoup that cost. Um, but just the cost of risk more generally as things become less um, reliable. Uh, so the system breaks down, there's more friction. Uh, auto insurance is, is absolutely skyrocketing. There was a piece in the Wall Street Journal pointing out that auto insurance is up, uh, I don't have the chart in front of me, but it's up like 40% cumulative since pre-COVID. That's a huge increase in insurance. And that's because of repair costs. It's all sorts of friction, lack of workers, inability to get parts quickly, you know, EVs that are gumming up the system because there's new, you know, ways of doing things. I'm repeating a lot of what I said uh, earlier on this, but um, look at traveler's insurance. Look at that stock. My goodness. Like w when you have a, uh, an environment like this and insurance companies are leading the market, that's weird. Um, Travelers, by the way, absolutely exploded in the last uh, in the last month or two in terms of price, which is why I pointed out. But um, that's a that's bad in itself. But the issue is that it's self reinforcing, because the the more things get bad, the higher the price of risk gets, which means things get clogged up even more uh, at the margin. You can't send that ship, you know, through the through the Red Sea because it just doesn't make sense financially. And then you have, you know, additional friction yeah. entering the system. That's a good point. And we haven't talked about this, but I mean, it's, it's maybe something good to bring up because the other weird thing about risk is that, you know, most of the, th most of the risks that we talk about here are not going to happen. Roger Baker, who's been on this podcast before, he used to tell me as an analyst, like, yeah, your job is to find the 10 things that are risky and just also realize that nine out of 10 times, the thing you find is not going to happen. Uh, that if you're in the business of risk, you're about preparedness and things like that. And you have to be willing for people to think that you're a little bit crazy, crazy so that when the one out of 10 thing happens, you're prepared and you actually have a plan. And we've sort of seen that with markets in general. Like we've talked to some guys who were talking about using geopolitics and investing and things like that. And I do think that you find that people get some vague sense that, oh, risk is up. So we're going to head into this asset. And then the risk maybe doesn't come to fruition or the risk appears in a completely different part of the world, even though it might be interconnected. And the correct thing to do would have been to fade the risk, not to lean into the risk. So much so that you even have even folks like Cousin Marco coming out here and basically saying fade geopolitical risk. That's how you do it. I think that's a little, I don't know, too simplistic. It's, it's almost like a buzzword, but there is that sort of thing out there. And it's also, you know, at CI, we're doing investing and things like that. I also do work with individual companies. And that's also a very different mindset because the companies, you stack on all the risks and you say, look, risks are elevated. And then they have to be ready for whatever is going to happen. doesn't mean that it's not going to happen, but what they want is for you to tell them, hey, this is something, even if it's a 5% chance of happening, it's something you should have in the back of your mind. If you get a call at 3 a.m. from your executive vice president, you should have a, a plan in a drawer that you can immediately give them so that they, they know that you've sort of thought through this thing. Whereas that's, that's not really how it works from an investor point of view. And the reason I bring that up is because where we're getting the physical, the, the really physical disruption right now is in the Red Sea. The risks are elevated in the South China Sea, in the Strait of Malacca. They're elevated for weather reasons in, in, in Panama. Mississippi River also, weather reasons, has been so, sort of driving some of those things. You look around at all these choke points, there's actually risks in all of them. But right now, it's the Red Sea that is taking the cake. And the point that we're trying to make here, or at least that I'm trying to make, when you think about it from that risk management point of view, not necessarily from the what do I buy in the market point of view, but if you're thinking about the risk management point of view, or when I'm talking to one of my corporate clients, I start saying, all right, well, we got to stack five or six risks now on top of each other, that if one of these things goes, we could really have a domino effect that gets there. I don't think that's the most likely thing, 
but that's a scary world to, to live in. And as you said, how do you prepare for that? And what does insurance cost? And how much do your backup plans cost? And how do you build resilient? Like, it's a very, very difficult world to interact with for a lot of these companies. Um, and, and it's very also then hard to translate that into investing. And there's a real cost to that. I mean, both a financial cost, as we said, with insurance, because in the example you gave, you know, Roger Baker pointing out, what are the 10 risks? Well, now when there's 10 risks, you have to, you have to price that into markets. So even like, I mean, this is, imagine fire insurance on your home. Almost certainly your home is not going to catch on fire, but you still have to pay every month some amount of money to have insurance against whatever risk that that is. Like that's how markets price and risk. So that's the sort of hidden tax that emerges when risks multiply or the probability of them gets, even if it's slightly higher, it's like still not going to probably happen, but it's goes from, you know, 0.5% to 5%. That's a huge increase, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it gets priced accordingly. And the other thing that you mentioned, um, which I think is, is relevant, especially from the investment side, like obviously from the corporate side, they have to spend time and effort to figure this stuff out. How are you going to get your stuff from, you know, uh, from Guangdong to, you know, Antwerp now, like that is a real cost on real companies, but even for investors and people in general, um, the more stuff gets volatile and unpredictable and it changes and the more stuff they're like, we have two different wars going on right now, just in the immediate headlines. And then there's many conflicts happening below the surface. When you think of the amount of headspace that's required just to think about everything, if you're making any sort of decision as an investor, as a corporate capital deployer, um, that's a tax on you, on your time. Like, and, and maybe that's a nebulous concept, but I can tell you, like you and I, when there's weeks, when there's a lot going on, it's it's a burden <laughs> it's a burden to just keep up with what's happening and, th and that's our job but anyone who's an actor and a thinker which is almost everyone with any sort of responsibility um that weighs on them and that's an underappreciated factor on top of all this yeah. and a cost a real cost well that was a good rabbit hole we went down do you, do you want to now talk about ev overcapacity from china plank plank two in your argument <laughs> <laughs> well, plank two, I guess, is, and, and this is getting to what you said about geopolitics, because I think I'm going to get to plank two, but it's connected to this notion of people associating geopolitics with kind of vague, risky war stuff. Geopolitics is like, oh, it's the Middle East. It's someone shooting a missile. It's, you know, there's a small scale war somewhere that might affect some tiny little widget and something. That's how most investors think about geopolitics. And I think as, as you know, we've sort of based our firm around, like that's just fundamentally missing 98% of the picture. Um, Cause the impact of geopolitics is not just like, hey, when something blows up, like what's gonna be the impact for the next two weeks? You know, in that regard, I think, um, you know, that's the sort of shorting geopolitical risk that I think Marco is, is talking about in that context. Um, the value of it is in identifying these sorts of things. So EV overcapacity, why is China building out EV overcapacity? There are, you know, meaningful geopolitical reasons for that, which we've spoken about and we don't have to rehash here. But the fact is that is a major force in the marketplace right now, a major force. And it's having implications and ramifications all over the world. So just to set the stage here, um, demand expectations for EVs have been ratcheting down. So a lot of the rosiest projections, you know, everyone sort of knows this now. This has become common knowledge, which by the way, back padding time, we called out multiple times is likely to happen. So we got that one right. Um, but the the ramifications of this are China has built out this EV overcapacity by throwing major subsidies to dozens of companies to try to build this industry up as a counterweight to other things that you know it's trying to diversify away from. 
and it's you know going into European markets, it's going into other foreign markets with this EV leadership um, to try to find demand. Uh, but part of this whole theme, as expectations come down, as all of the supply of all of the stuff that goes into EVs that was you know built up the capacity for it, built up in anticipation of this huge growth. Now the other shoe is falling because the price of lithium is down like 90% from its peak. Uh, the price of nickel has absolutely collapsed. Um, so you have these huge waves that are being amplified across the world, not because of some free market thing and, oh, you can ignore geopolitics. Like you could understand and analyze that if you understood what was happening with Chinese EVs and why. And it wasn't some, you know, economic textbook that was going to give you the answer. It's understanding sort of those geopolitical imperatives, the fundamentals of what was happening. Why are they promoting this? Why are they doing it? Um, and as a brief aside, the thing I find kind of interesting, just thinking about, you know, country by country winners and losers is the irony is a lot of the incremental supply that got built to service the EVs in lithium and in nickel was in more developed countries. And now they're the ones who are getting whacked while uh, countries like Indonesia, countries like Chile and Argentina, they're the low cost producers mm -hmm. of these things. So they're riding out the storm and in many ways they're going to, they're going to be sitting pretty relative to some of these competitors that have been squeezing them. Um, so uh, anyway, that's going a little rambly, but no, another not at all. And it, it does broad area. It dovetails. I hate, um, I hate that I'm about to bring up Elon Musk because I try to go out of my way not to talk about Elon Musk for reasons we can get into some other time when we're drinking whiskey. Um, but he had some interesting quotes this week where he, he sort of raised this idea again of a new cheaper EV that Tesla would make. It was suggested maybe it would be around $25,000. The current lowest model that Tesla sells is 35000 And one of the reasons for that is because the Chinese EV company BYD, I mean, they're the low cost producer <laughs> and you know, their exports are surging, are surging in part because, as you said, the Chinese market is oversupplied, and so now China's doing exactly what it does with it with everything else. It makes a lot of stuff, and now it's selling it out into the market. And one thing that that Musk said on on his investor call this week, um, he said, you know, Chinese car companies are the most competitive car companies in the world. And then I'm quoting him here: if there are not trade barriers established, they will pretty much demolish all other car companies in the world. They are extremely good. And that goes back to what we're talking about with the trade war and friction and everything else. There you have like a U.S. EV automaker that is saying the only way that we're going to be competitive, the only way we're going to be able to do this is if the government steps in and puts its foot on the scale. And there are lots of ways in which Chinese trade practices are not, uh, I, I don't know what the, I don't know what the, the right word usage is here to be without being judgmental. But like there are a lot of nefarious Chinese trade practices. There are lots of things that China does that don't line up with their commitments or don't line up with WTO rules and things like that. I'm not sure you can make that case for EVs. EVs was just, they made it a national priority. They got really good at making them cheaply and now they sell the, they're the low cost producer. Like I don't see, like, so what if the Chinese government state owned enterprises gave them some support? Like the market is supposed to bear out that way. And it's, it's just weird to see sort of, you know, the, the most, should we call Musk the most famous like American businessman alive right now calling, like literally saying China's more competitive. My beautiful company, Tesla can't make it unless the U S government comes in with protectionism. I mean, it's, it's kind of shocking. It is shocking, but I think, um, it goes to, the heart of what China has gotten right in many ways in the last 30 years, which is the support that they've given to EV companies in particular is in the form of cheap capital. I mean, that's how the system kind of works that China is pursuing and Japan and Korea did before them is cheap capital. Well, that's great. We're going to, you have a startup, we're going to give you cheap capital, go build stuff, go out, you know, sell cars all over the place. Um, that's a lot easier to do in theory than it is in practice, because inevitably what happens is if you have no discipline, then you give a bunch of money to someone and they, they throw it down a hole and they're not competitive and they don't have a product that can compete on global markets. 
especially if they're not outward looking. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, Turkey tried this uh, pretty aggressively in the uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. They had sort of a, you know, a, uh, support for domestic manufacturing. They were trying to build domestic manufacturing and, you know, there was kind of goodies being given out and whoever was close to, to the regime was, was getting subsidized capital, but they weren't, you know, exporting. They weren't going out and using it and saying, I'm going to go compete against Tesla and I'm going to make a car that like side by side, someone would want to buy, even if a Tesla was right next to it. They did not do that. And most countries don't do that. And that's something that China's done and that Japan and, and Korea did before them that is the secret sauce to that, uh, to that model. Um, and that's when it works because you can use the subsidized capital to basically give a leg up to an industry. You know, the, one, of the, one of the great books on this uh, subject, uh, God, I forget the name of it, but the, the author, um, he, his whole argument is he says like, People who argue for, um, you know, uh, basically free trade and and that you shouldn't do this, he said it's the equivalent of being like going to your your six year old kid and saying like, hey, go get a job, like go out there, you know, like clearly they're not equipped. So, um, you know, giving the subsidized capital is helping them grow and assuming they can they can go out and then compete with it, it, it has a net positive value in, in those cases. Um, so I, I, I do want to just point out, it's not all negative. Like we speak about it in a negative way because there are many negative aspects to it, but it's not black and white. This isn't bad China, good US, like no, no, no. It's very, you know, I don't know what to think about it sometimes, but um, in many cases it turns out positive. And, and all these Chinese cars, m most of these companies are going to go away but some of them will do very well. And that's, that's a win. That's good for everybody. Well, and, and both sides, like the, the thing to think about it is that both sides are benefiting from this. Like China has benefited immensely from being a low cost producer and getting all this foreign investment and everything else. And U.S. consumers, some you know, segments of, um, you know, of, of the U.S. electorate, have been hurt a lot by China and by globalization because they've lost their jobs and there wasn't good policy there to help them transition to something else. Um, but by and large, the American consumer has benefited hugely from this system because our products are cheap. Like you wouldn't be able to get iPhones and everything else for as cheap as they are right now if we made them all in the United States. And I won't drone on about lentils for, for the next hour, but just to bring this back into things that are on top of my mind, like one place where this is really, really obvious is in the United States, we have gotten used to the idea that food is supposed to be cheap. And when eggs go up a dollar per dozen or when milk prices go up and things like that, like, you know, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times and Washington Post all collectively set themselves on fire and, oh my God, inflation, oh, we have to blame the White House and things like that, rather than understanding that the way that farmers make money right now is by exporting abroad. And if you're going to have more friction and if you're going to have countries like, let's say, India announce this month, which they did, that they wanted to become completely self-sufficient um, in lentils and chickpeas and all these other pulse crops by 2028 so that they don't have to import anymore, well, then if you want to protect the American farmer, you need to do exactly what Musk is asking for too. You have to make sure that, well, actually we need to support American farmers with whatever subsidies need to be Hell, maybe get a farm bill together. We're still waiting on a farm bill. Or get Americans used to the idea that maybe good food that's grown in America is going to cost a little bit more. And that that's just sort of a, you know, if you're going to make things in America, you're going to pay more for those things. And that's a trade-off that's going to be there. And that's not the world the U.S. government is in. Both parties are in this fantasy world where, yes, things can be made in America and they will remain as cheap as they are. Like, those things don't work. You can either have the cheap free trade system with its, you know, dislocations and inequalities and everything else. Or you can move towards the you know, more self-sufficiency argument and you can be proud of the things that are made here and train generations of people to make things with their hands and all these other things, but it's going to cost more because there's no way you're going to make it for as cheap as they can make it in China or in somewhere else. And that, that is not a reckoning um, that certainly the United States and I think most Western governments have really come to themselves with. You know, we mentioned Japan earlier with the semiconductors. Japan and South Korea in particular are interesting 
case studies right now because what those companies are doing is they're now building parallel supply chains. So they want one supply chain that services the Chinese market because that market is big enough that they feel like they can't turn their back on it. And then a completely different supply chain that's going to service American markets or Western markets and things like that. It'll be really interesting to see if you can get those supply chains all working together or whether you're eventually going to get tension between them and even more friction as people get mad about things going from from x and y and z but again just tangible ways in which this friction that we're talking about is coming into relief and and evs are at the center of it but i don't know in some ways i think evs and semis that they're hogging a lot of the light um you know we, we were joking about lentils here it's actually very serious like if you go and look at you know, China dumping pea protein into the United States and what that does to pea manufacturers, and what that does for the American farmer, like all of these things are interconnected and it's happening in so many different industries. Yeah, agriculture <laughs> is a tricky one. Um, I do want to point out one other sort of side of this story, which was also in the news this week, which I'm sure 99% of people didn't see, 99.99, was... You know, when you think about um, industrial policy, if you want to call it that, you know, making things artificially uh, cheap, like tweaking the economics of a business in order to incent it to grow for better or for worse. Um, you know, one of the other big success stories is not just EVs, but also just the battery uh, area itself. So building batteries and solar. I mean, those are two areas where China has followed a similar playbook, so to speak. I mean, everyone knows that China produces the vast, vast majority of, you know, the uh, uh, underlying uh, silicon that goes into PV cells, um, that they're one of the biggest uh, producers of batteries, that cattle is sort of the national champion churning these things out. And in this case, it's interesting because if you go back 10 years, I mean, it's very easy to remember a time when these things were just not economic. Everyone was talking about, oh, solar and batteries and whatever, and no one was building them because they weren't economic. They weren't cheap enough, yeah. right? No one had the incentive. No one had the time horizon to build things that were not going to be economic in the near term. And fast forward to today, um, the data point that I saw, which was really interesting, was uh, just thinking about China making a decision, an industrial policy decision, and it having ramifications across the world. In this case, a positive one. So uh, Hawaiian Electric Industries, hmm. which um, incidentally, I we tried shorting in 2013 um, for reasons sort of related to solar, which we don't have to get into, and were, were turned out quite wrong. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I do not have a warm spot for Hawaiian electric industries. Um, but they came out. Hawaii, as you can imagine, is one of the most aggressive and leading geographies in the U.S. for deployment of solar. And they came out this week and they said that they were building, uh, they, they were, you know, scoping out and completing the project to build their first significant, like, utility-scale battery storage mm -hmm which is interesting in itself. But the thing that really caught my eye was they said, so everyone knows the problem with solar is oftentimes you just can't take the energy because it's so the intermittency of the energy doesn't match the waves of demand. Um, so they came out and said that the amount of solar that they you know, basically can't use in some form is going to be reduced by 69%. So the amount of intermittency that gets wasted would be reduced by 69%. That's a huge efficiency gain. Yeah. And, and the thing that really caught the eye was, I don't know uh, to what extent the audience will be familiar with how utility economics work, but basically if utility builds something, they're going to get paid for it. You know, they get paid based on how much capital they deploy. But the really interesting thing was that uh, Hawaiian Electric was actually predicting that customers would see a reduction in their net bill because the efficiency gains from putting these battery utility scale battery storage uh, projects into place were sufficient that they outweighed what they would get paid for building this giant battery plant. Hmm. Um, so that's unequivocally good news. 
and it came because shit just got really cheap you know <laughs> like that's there's no two ways around it so i think you can call that a success story um incidentally this week i'm sure you saw this i haven't had a chance to really dig into this but i saw the eia came out and announced that uh i think it was for the last year they estimated that all of the incremental uh uh, energy demand growth in the world all of the incremental growth was uh was mopped up by renewables including nuclear fission that's huge i mean I, I don't know if it's true and obviously there's a lot of headlines and i'm sure there's nuance to that but just the fact that we're close enough where that's a headline it's really interesting it's it's a testament to the power of cheap i mean it, it probably is so they've been sort of forecasting that around 2024 2025 for the last couple of years they've been forecasting um that this would be the year where renewables would start to mop up the incremental growth um now we're still not that renewables is still not eating into current demand right so it's really just the growth that's happening from wherever we are right now it's by 27 28 you know, end of the decade that they're talking about, there'll be enough renewable capacity coming online every year that not only will it satisfy the incremental growth, but it'll start to meet into current demand. And we'll see if that forecast comes true, because if that forecast comes true, and I've said before, I, I think there's a world in which energy is hugely deflationary towards the end of the decade. And if it is, it's because that's what's going to happen. Now, of course, it's going to depend on different geographies, and it's going to depend on some things that we can't predict. How much is, is power demand going to increase in India over the next five years? How much, is it, how much is it going to increase in a place like Nigeria or Ethiopia over the next five years? And will those countries go to renewables because they're cheap? Or will they you know, take advantage of oil and coal because it's easier and cheaper for them in their different geographies? And all of this, you know, what we're talking about here will be in Western countries. So we'll have you know, renewable energy in Western countries and different varieties too, right? Maybe hydrogen in Europe, maybe nuclear in, in China, and then sort of the dirty fossil fuels in the rest of the other place. And I, I don't know if you also saw that this is something we've talked about a couple of times, but um, Brian Winter, who's uh, an editor over at America's Quarterly, one of my favorite guys to follow on Twitter right now because he focuses a lot on Latin America and Brazil, um, he, d he posted a chart about... Um, how much oil Guyana is really sitting on. And I sort of knew this. I, I think I've talked about it every once in a while. I remember, I think it was in 2017 when ExxonMobil was helping them discover it. The, the press release said it was a quote unquote fairy tale size of oil. But Brian put the chart up on Twitter and it was, I mean, it was ridiculous. It was like two, three times like the UAE, like some of these major producers and things like that. So the other tricky part about what you're talking about is what if we're in a world where we have a lot more oil by the end of the decade than we do today? And where OPEC is not the big force that it is right now, OPEC thinks its share is going to you know, increase the global oil production. We talked last week about how, well, if you go to the IEA reports, they're saying the opposite. They're saying that you look at all this incremental production that's coming online around the periphery, it won't be there. And it'll be really interesting to see whether these you know, renewable, whether the cheapness of renewables can keep up, especially in a world of geopolitical friction where China's doing the silicon for all the solar things, or in a world where countries like Guyana or, or you know, Argentina, which is on the, on the verge of its own shale revolution, are just like, hey, we're open for business. We want to be the new like, low-cost oil producers of the world. It, it'll be interesting to see that go. And so the, the report that you've talked about, it's, it's, it's cool that that forecast has landed, that we're starting to mop up the incremental demand with renewables. But the real question for me is three, four years down the road with oil production, I assume, like increasing, and with all this geopolitical friction, is it going to eat into current demand? And is, is that going to happen globally or just in Western markets? That's a much harder forecast to get right, but I think it's the question to be thinking about. Um, it's much of that will depend on sort of the incremental cost of getting the barrels up. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's just two kind of uh, two things to keep in mind when you're thinking about that. The first is obviously inflation. So um, it's expensive to have guys who work on oil rigs. Like that's only getting more and more expensive no matter where you go. And never mind equipment and that sort well, of thing. I, so I assume, inflation. I, I assume is that we're going to have to, drones to do all these things or robots ahead. to do these things soon, right? <laughs> 
Well, not not quite, not quite yet. Soon, but not today. Um, and uh, and the the uh, the other thing is, uh, so that's the negative. Obviously, is you know bringing this stuff up. Um, but then the and the cost of capital, obviously, like all of these things are going up. So at the margin, like just look at the price of West Texas crude today. It troughed in the low 70s, and we had a you know significant manufacturing downturn across the world, and miles driven was not hitting new highs. Yeah. So if it troughs in the 70s, what does that tell you about you know thinking about how inflation has gone from pre-COVID to today? Like what is that break-even price on the typical project? Uh, that's that's getting rolled out. I, th I think that's an open question. I'm sure Goldman Sachs or, or you know all those guys have a some decent estimate of what that is. Um, but I'll tell you one thing: it's going up. Um, the other thing that is uh, worth keeping in mind is uh, oil recovery. So um, we know some people in this industry and kind of know it well. And there's some interesting stuff happening in oil recovery. So most people don't realize most of the oil that's out there is sitting in wells that's that have been drilled and they just aren't being operated because it's not economic to get, like they'll put up 10 barrels of oil per day, something like that. So I think it's something like 60% of the found oil is just sitting there and we can't get it economically. So there's been a lot of innovation in this area um, the one that I'm most familiar with, as you know, is is an approach that uses microbes to essentially break up the oil that's trapped in these formations and release it to go. Um, that appears to be having meaningful success, and there's a lot of innovation happening there. So it's sort of a wild card. I don't know enough to say, oh, this is going to meaningfully impact things, but it's something that I don't think anyone's really talking about. And it's a pretty big opportunity. And it seems like there's some stuff there that anyone who's thinking about oil should at least become familiar with because it has the potential to be big. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about Chinese capital controls before we wrap it up? Or do you want to save that for next week? I don't know if there's that much to say other than the fact that Chinese retail investors are clamoring to buy U.S. stocks. And that's very interesting. And the Chinese... Um, Mutual fund houses are starting to restrict them. I don't know if that's under orders from above, probably. I don't know if I've ever seen that in my career, that there's been such a frenzy for Chinese retail investors to own stocks in the U.S. Um, well, and there really there has been so much financial news out of China this week. But you know, the the flip side of that is that the Chinese government has been hinting at this new stabilization fund to prop up Chinese markets themselves. Um, you probably saw Jack Ma was was famously buying hundreds of millions of dollars of Chinese equities hand over fist. I guess he's trying to to get in good with the Chinese Communist Party again. I don't know. He's being rehabilitated. But I mean, China cut the reserve requirement ratio for banks. Um, they're talking about more stimulus measures. There were a bunch of interesting things that I haven't really quite dived into deep enough yet, but about deepening ties with Hong Kong and ties between the People's Bank of China and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Um, you just kind of look across the spectrum. Uh, China continues to try and, and stimulate different parts of the economy. But to your point, even as as Chinese investors maybe are looking abroad, like the Chinese government seems to have this idea that the Chinese stock market is something that they have to support, that if you have instability within the Chinese stock markets, that, that's bad in some fundamental way. And that, that's interesting. Um, you know, the, the Chinese stock market is not that important uh, in terms of like how much of the average Chinese person's assets are in Chinese equities. Like it's a relatively small number, but it's, and this is a story that maybe is, is true globally. Cause you know, we t we've talked about Turkey in this context that, in the midst of, you know, the devaluation of the Turkish lira and the inflation crisis in Turkey, suddenly you had tens of millions of Turkish citizens who were trying to buy stocks and buy equities in ways that they hadn't before. I think this is true in Brazil too. So, um, it's interesting to me just that stock markets in general for the Chinese retail investor are even on their minds. You know, they've they've gone from buying the fourth ghost property somewhere else to 
do I want to own U.S. equities? Eventually, they'll probably be shunted into Chinese equities because that's what the Chinese government is going to try to incentivize them to do. I don't know. Um, well, it's worth it's worth thinking about because we did talk about Hong Kong last week. Um, the there is evidence that uh, in other cases you mentioned Brazil, where when the returns dry up in one asset class, you get a significant shift into something else. Um, so in Brazil, you used to be able to make good real returns just buying bonds because the cost of capital was so high in the country. That opportunity has gone away. And as a result, you saw the real emergence of the Brazilian hedge fund industry because previously no one had to do any work to make money. Now you actually have to go you know, research some stuff. Um, I wonder if you'll see something similar in China where the property market is no longer you know, the sure thing that it was. Will people start looking to other options? I don't know. I'm sure they will, and I'm sure Goldman Sachs and everybody else is salivating at the, t at the opportunity. <laughs> and they probably won't get access to it. Um, all right, well, anything else on your mind before we, before we say goodbye to the listeners, Rob? No, that's it. I'm going to go get my baby and get out of here. No, uh, no deep lessons from your, your early readings of the Douglas MacArthur biography you want to share with us? <laughs> Um, I'm less impressed with him than I was expecting to be. That's my, I'm, I'm up to the initial invasion of uh, the Philippines. And so far he's not covered himself in glory. Hopefully he turns it around. Yeah. I, I don't find the Philippines to be the, he, he sort of, his, his, his great successes come later on, but uh, his behavior around that, I, I, I agree with you, leaves something to be desired. I'll tell you one thing that struck me not to go on about this is the fact that my God, we really just like repeat what our parents did so much. Like it, the story of his father was so fascinating, mm -hmm. his military career, his values, the way he behaved, like he was kind of a carbon copy of him. And so was his brother and, and not just through nurture, but also just through nature. So, uh, we're bound to end up just like our our fathers, I guess. That's a sobering thought. Well, I, I think we have a choice about that. I mean, also, like, people like MacArthur or, like, Churchill were themselves so remarkable. You know, we don't talk about Winston Churchill's sons or, like, the, the children of these people. So, in some ways, they were, like, singular singular figures at singular moments in history. Um, but, I, but I take your point. Like, uh, nature, in some ways, uh, is much more powerful than nurture. But... That's a conversation for a different time. Uh, and we'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about cognitive investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor.